Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of our Towards Life 3.0 series, the first one of uh, this whole series in this academic year. My name is Matthias Wister, and I am the director of the Carr Center for Humanity at Kennedy School. And I am welcoming you also on behalf of Sushma Raman, who is the executive director of the Carr Center and will be joining us for the Q&A period. Now, as many of you know, our series Towards Life 3.0 Ethics and Technology in the 21st Century has now been going on for a few years. The title of that series we take from Max Tegmark's wonderful book, Life 3.0, Being Human in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. The goal of that series is to explore ethical and human rights related issues that arise in the course of the technological innovation that is happening all around us and might eventually take us to a full-fledged Life 3.0 of life, phase of life populated by entities that get to design both their culture, their software, so to speak, and their bodies, their hardware. We do not know if that kind of life will ever emerge or when, but we also don't want to start thinking about its ethical dimensions only once it's clear that it will indeed emerge. And in any event, there are plenty of such challenges, ethical and human rights related all around us already that occur as part of the technological innovation that we are living through. And that already brings me to today's speaker, to today's topic. We are very lucky to have with us today, Professor Phil Howard, who will speak on human rights and the global information environment. That our information environment is something one has to worry about is rather clear by now. Misinformation and disinformation spread everywhere, often in ways that have major news outlets as a source, but then social media magnify those messages. And social media also have ways of generating and spreading their own falsehood and misleading statements. Political theorists Russell Moorhead and Nancy Rosenblum recently published a book called A Lot of People Are Saying, in which they contrast what they call the new conspiracism with an older conspiracism. The older version, though revisionist by definition, was much concerned with evidence, at least on the face of it. It presented alleged evidence to its audience to depict established views that having been established by dark manipulative, manipulative forces and even invited that audience to join the search for more of such evidence. By contrast, the new conspiracism, um, in, in the new conspiracism, conspiracy theories are actually devoid of any theory. Their source of authority merely is repetition, which is why uh, they are calling uh, the book a lot of people are saying. And you might remember a former president who liked to say uh, that a lot of people are saying that information environments with such features, and there's obviously more to say on what these problematic features are, generate legitimacy problems for whoever aims to govern goes without saying. And it is a short step from making such observations to asking the question of whether the human rights framework as such has something to say on these matters. And that takes us to the topic for today and the presenter for today. today. Let me say just a few words about Professor Howard before turning things over to him. Grounded in political science, sociology, as well as communication studies, Phil Howard is professor of internet studies at the Oxford Internet Institute, the OII, uh, a professorial fellow at Balliol College at Oxford, and also the principal investigator at the OII's program on democracy and technology. His research has focused on the use of digital media for both civic engagement and social control in countries around the world, addressing topics like digital activism, information access, modern governance in both democracies and authoritarian regimes, the need for, societal, for social media to get a radical rebuild to foster healthy debate, ways of combating disinformation and other related topics. His 2020 book, Lie Machines, Lie Machines, How to Save Democracy from Troll Armies, Deceitful Robots, Junk News Operations, and Political operative, Operatives, explores the emerging phenomenon of computational propaganda as a serious threat to democracy, which involves the tailoring and targeting of propaganda to individual spheres and weaknesses. With this kind of research, of course, uh, and Professor Howard is ideally positioned to discuss with us the topic of the day, which again is human rights and the global in information environment. He will speak to something like 25 um, minutes and then we'll have uh, Q&A. Uh, Sushma and I will start us off. We will be screening the questions that are coming from the audience. You as the audience, you are strongly encouraged to 
put your own questions in the YouTube chat function. So we will be monitoring that and then channeling these questions to uh, Professor Howard. And now without further ado, um, Phil, the screen is yours. Wonderful, thank you very much, um, Matthias, for that uh, general generous introduction. It's a real pleasure to be able to join you as a Car Center Fellow this year. And what I'd like to do with my 25 minutes or so is present some of the latest research we've been doing on um, misinformation trends as a, as a global phenomenon and then specifically around COVID. And then uh, introduce some of the questions I wanna ask while I'm, while I'm doing my fellowship year with you. Um, I think the human rights frame is, is uh, an intriguing one for this particular problem. Um, and there are other competing frames. So what I'd like to do is, is sort of work through my, uh, a possible vision for how um, thinking of misinformation as a human rights problem might allow us to imagine a level of cooperation to, to solve the problems that, that um, misinformation poses for public life. So to get us started, I'm going to share screen and uh, show off um, show off a Prezi that I have developed for us. And, and um, what I'll do with the presentation is say a little bit um, by way of introduction. Uh, about of the uh, by way of introduction on the program on democracy and technology what we do um i'll say a little bit about the lie machines the book um and if anybody's interested in a copy by the end of this talk please just drop me an email i'm happy to send you an electronic version or a discount card i'm still uh, flattered when anybody's interested in this uh, and i'll move on to some of the contemporary challenges and end with strategies I've, been doing this for five or six years now, um, studying misinformation. And uh, as you pointed out, Matthias, um, President Trump generated an enormous amount of it uh, for us to, um, to study. I'm very eager to move on to strategies and responses and problem solving at this point. The program on democracy and technology has a staff of 15 to 20 people, depending on the year, the time of the academic year. And our broad mission is to increase civic engagement and solve public problems through social data science. We tend to work in countries where we have expertise, where there's a doctoral student, uh, uh, somebody with a PhD, a postdoc or a faculty colleague who knows the language, knows the political culture and can help us with the seed lists we need uh, before we do any machine learning around the social media trends. It, I think we find over and over again that it's that local context, the, the ethnographic, the anthropological, that actually generates meaningful interpretation of whatever we find. And the basic science behind the instruments we use when we search for misinformation has been supported at first by the National Science Foundation, more recently by the European Research Council, and the Ford Foundation supports our outreach dissemination activities. Lime Machines as a book uh, came out a year ago from Yale University Press, which means it's, um, I'm still very proud of it, but it's already a year out of date. It is based on an analysis of the open source data that we, we collected during the 2016 and 2018 uh, elections in the US, during the Brexit debate here, and um, during multiple other election incidents in which significant amounts of misinformation uh, were dumped on electorates. Uh, overall, the book is broken up into sections that, that talk about the production side of things, the consumption side of things, the distribution side of things, and, and it lands on several policy suggestions, which are um, somewhat abstract. Um, and it, I imagine, I, I, I struggle to see how the contemporary dialogue between social media firms and governments will ever uh, resolve itself in a way that fits with some of the more abstract notions that we have about what a healthy democracy, what a deliberative democracy would look like. And for the last year since the book came out, we've been plunged into one of the most complex misinformation campaigns I, I have ever seen. It uh, involves a long-standing social movement, a middle-class social movement around uh, resisting vaccinations with a cult of personality around Bill Gates and uh, another long-standing theme that the government is trying to uh, inject RFID chips into our arms, uh, stories about 5G killing the bees. It's, it's a, an extremely complex narrative. 
and I think what makes it um, successful, one of the things that makes it successful is the, the absence of clear and consistent health information about what we should be doing, about what, pub, uh, what uh, public health officials are doing or what the medical consensus is about a particular, about the sources of the virus, um, the conditions, the, the role of masks um, in treatment. And then of course the consistency and flip-flopping uh, the different governments around the world have, have done. These things help build up the appetite for the inside story and the hidden truth and the story behind the scenes, which is what misinformation campaigns provide. Overall, even though there's, um, I want to talk about the specific um, COVID misinformation operations for the last year, um, the, the broad trend globally is upwards. The number of information operations running in each country has only increased. Um, we here in the program have done an annual inventory of countries with active misinformation operations. Our first inventory ran in 2017. These are, these are um, campaigns with formal organizations behind them. And I mean formal in the sociological sense. They have hierarchies and pay bonuses and job advertisements, retirement plans, telephones, receptionists, physical space. So these are not lone wolf operations. These are formal organizations in, so, in the sociological sense. We, there were uh, just under 30 countries with um, long-standing uh, long standing information operations at work. And, and interestingly, at that point, only a few of the operations were coordinated by private firms. So um, regular PR firms based in New York or Toronto or London um, have, have increasingly been drawn in to, to producing these information operations. Last year's report by 2020, um, pretty much every country we looked at had an active misinformation operation of some kind running well over 80 countries. We're discussing it as a team, whether it's worth reproducing this, because effectively, um, effectively uh, everywhere we look now, this was across uh, 12 different language groups too. It's, it's not just about English or, or advanced democracies. The other, change, the other thing that's changed over time is that uh, in the in 2017, 2018, many of the operations we studied involved military units that had been retasked to doing social media, often around a complex humanitarian disaster or trying to um, denigrate an opposition activist. Uh, these days, it's not these military units, it's the professional firms, the political consultants, um, the social media gurus, right, who help, who help manage these campaigns. Another important thing that changed last year, along with the arrival of COVID as, a, as a, an issue, a global issue, China really arrived as a, a, a player in global information operations. This was mostly to do with um, Western interest in the treatment of Uyghurs in the Northwest um, and the treatment of democracy advocates in Hong Kong in December a year ago. Prior to those sort of two events, China was not the PRC. The PRC was not interested in what, uh, that interested in what English language Twitter had to say about um, human rights within the country. Since those two issues emerged, uh, significant operations in English on social media platforms you can't actually use in China ha have emerged around human rights issues. So this, this framing exercise is now um, not just dominated by the uh, Internet Research Agency in Russia or uh, Iran, it's, it's, there's now several players and China's operations are quite large. About a year ago, uh, we did a survey of 142 com countries, uh, a little over 150,000 respondents on the perceptions of risk, the, the, the fear of being misled by information that would come over social media, over the internet. More than half the regular internet users, 53%, flagged disinformation as one of the things that, um, one of the perceived risks they faced in um, living modern life. Now, I think context is important here. Um, not all of the people in the sample were regular internet users. And the number one choices are clearly quality of life, water access, employment opportunity. But, but for those who are regular internet users, this is the most serious of their concerns. Almost three quarters of the internet users were worried about uh, multiple threats, including online disinformation, fraud, sexual harassment online. And 
So the perception of risk, as you can imagine, varied from region to region and country to country. The concerns about disinfo uh, were highest in North America, they're highest in Europe, uh, they're relatively low in East and Southeast Asia. Uh, in Latin America, there was a noticeable difference uh, there. It's mostly about harassment online, particularly among um, the young women uh, who are internet users in Latin America. So there are differences in how particular countries perceive this risk. But globally, consistently, on average, misinformation is the number one concern people have in using social media. Now, COVID-related misinformation has um, bloomed in significant and unfortunate ways uh, over the last 18 months. Uh, about four months ago, we did a study of how far misinformation can travel. This was a story about the source of COVID, whether it originated in a, in a lab in Denver or in Northern Italy or, or in, in China. And we found over a multi-week period that uh, on, a, on a good week, um, especially if a, a Hollywood star retweets or a, a Western politician pushes something out over their social media accounts, the misinformation about public health from one of the state-backed news agencies, this is primarily in Russia and China, um, misinformation from one of these sources can reach almost a billion social media user accounts. Now, if this is a straightforward, simple sum of a number. We took all the numbers of YouTube followers and uh, Instagram followers and Reddit followers and Facebook followers and for the major social media accounts for each of these outlets and simply summed them. We know many of these are duplicates and duds, but the punchline is, I think, still valuable here that on a significant, in a significant moment, um, in the right circumstances, many, many more people get misinformation about public health, the latest COVID research, than what can be produced by any particular news outlet. Since then, we've decided to spend less time looking at content. So the particular content that might try to misdirect uh, a public health or um, a conversation about a complex humanitarian disaster, to look at the, uh, the flow of money, how the money flows. In a particular study we did uh, called Profiting from the Pandemic, we wanted to investigate how the social media platforms continue to benefit, continue to profit, even after they've dealt with conflict, uh, with, um, with uh, problematic conflict, uh, content. So there's a, certainly a humanitarian disaster um, in Myanmar at the moment, even after the major platforms deal with um, the most, um, uh, most problematic content there is still a revenue stream that comes from hosting websites, from taking credit cards to support movements. Um, in the case of COVID-19, where our sample of websites looked at uh, scam websites, fraud, profiteering websites, selling t-shirts about issue areas, disseminating disinformation about public health. And, and even after you take away the content issue, there's the infrastructural support, the behavioral analytics, the tracker systems that that follow people from um, uh, a website where they identify with a particular social movement to the Facebook equivalents to other social media. Um, all of that infrastructure is what makes it possible to generate revenue for the people who are behind COVID misinformation. And uh, indirectly, of course, the major technology firms profit from that. The other interesting thing we found in doing this research is that a significant amount of the infrastructure that supports disinformation isn't necessarily resonant in the country for which disinformation is a problem. Now, for the COVID study I'm talking about here, we found that vast, vast proportions of the, the content and infrastructure around COVID misinformation targeted at the US, US social media users, is actually resident in Canada. It's maintained on Cloudflare's Canadian servers. So there's, there's an extraterritorial issue here. And part of what makes this an important part of what makes this a global problem is that Canada probably does have some responsibilities under international law to um, prevent harm befalling neighbor citizens in neighboring countries. In this case, the question is, does Canada have a responsibility to act if the vast majority of misinformation about COVID targeted at US users is held territorially uh, within its borders? A good chunk of the co content resides in Russia, and that I think would involve a separate, separate kind of conversation about what their responsibilities would be. 
as I said earlier on, I'm, I'm interested in moving on to strategies for coping, right? There's no doubt that there's a, a, a quite a range of um, conflict zones in which misinformation has made things worse. I think of misinformation as the policy area that prevents, prevents action in a whole range of other policy areas. The climate, nuclear, um, this number of attacks we've noticed over the 40, 45 uh, in-depth country studies that we've done over the years, there seems to be unfortunately a particularly powerful uh, strategy at taking, um, trying to take down women out of public life. Uh, prominent feminist intellectuals, female journalists, women politicians are in a sense, um, unfortunately so soft targets for misinformation. And over many countries, it's we've found incidents uh, in which it's uh, possible to drive to shape who participates in public life by uh, targeting, targeting people for messages, and misinformation on the basis of race and gender. So our strategy for improving the global information and information environment needs to involve research, right? I'm an academic, so of course I'm gonna say that, but it needs to involve research with a purpose, right? And a passion project. And for me, that's becoming about trying to promote human rights and development and discourage the use of, um, uh, the use of information infrastructure for passing falsehoods. The Lie Machines book ends with a chapter on what I see as the, the paths for developing an information infrastructure that we might want with democratic values and, and transparency values. One of the starting steps, as many of, the, many of you who, who, who work in technology areas know, one of the starting steps is making sure that your training data for uh, uh, any algorithms that you're developing, any machine learning that you're trying to do, making sure that your training data is fresh and as much as possible free of bias, systemic bias. Um, most of the applications we have that are driven by some complex machine learning tools or, or basic AI systems can barely account, can barely explain for where their training data has come from. And I think increasingly uh, being confident that a, an AI system, a machine learning tool will pass an audit of some kind means being able to do uh, the complete provenance of the data that has gone into training it. Now, the first, I think, the, the core concept I have that's a starting point um, for how to build this information infrastructure that might support human rights is based on an idea I borrowed from the Blood, Blood Diamonds campaign. As may, many of you may know, the, the Kimberley process created this system by which the diamond consumers in wealthy cities um, would have access to a record of where their diamonds had come from. And if the diamonds had come from the, the nastiest pit of, um, in, in Africa, uh, the idea was that the diamond consumer would not choose those diamonds if, if the provenance was there. I think similarly, we at the moment don't have the ability to look at our devices and ask who the ultimate beneficiary is of the data that, that's collected about us, our smart refrigerators, our smart coffee makers. Uh, Matthias, I know you're not active on social media, so you're, you're out of scope in some interesting ways from this kind of, um, this kind of scooping of data. But but presumably you use credit cards and you're in a city with, um, um, with active facial recognition running on, on um, the street corner cameras. There is a data trail that you, that we all leave behind and we can't get an audit of it. We don't know where the data goes. We don't know who benefits from the information that we leave behind. Having a system that allows us to check on who's benefiting from our data from each device actually opens up the possibility that we as an individual consumer of uh, technology might be able to donate data, right? To create alternative paths. So that if I, uh, we have a smart coffee maker, if I want to contribute my coffee consumption data to my favorite Haitian coffee collective for their analysis, I should be able to add, express myself almost as a citizen by donating data. I, I would also donate data to uh, our COVID researchers here at Oxford. I would um, commit data to the nonprofits that I want to support. I think this is a moment, I think data has become a form of civic expression that we as citizens don't have access to. Uh, we cannot control. And data donation will only be meaningful and process if we can have a sense of who's buying and selling stuff about us and whether we can, can donate 
the, the fresh data that we leave behind. I think it's important to have infrastructure that tithes and we have not built that internet, right? Some, uh, in some countries, the public spectrum is auctioned off and, and uh, sliv fractional amounts of funding goes to supporting public, um, public infrastructure, public um, interest journalism. Figuring out the ways to tax uh, or to create incentives, market incentives, that direct revenue towards civil society groups, towards um, nonprofit journalism, building that infrastructure that tithes is gonna, uh, is gonna be an important part of building the, the social media that we might want. One of the most interesting rules about, um, about privacy and data management in the US context for elections is this rule on a rule that a data mining firm can't profit by selling voter registration files. The US is one of the few countries that has a rule like this. And um, there doesn't have, the US doesn't have many rules governing data mining. But the idea is that um, our voter registration files are a public asset. Data miners are allowed to profit from everything they merge with those voter registration files. So it's, it's difficult to disaggregate. But, the principle is there, and it's a principle I like, and that is simply that there are categories of information, perhaps also public health information, uh, perhaps basic demographics or the kinds of information we might collect through a census. There are categories of information that are in the public interest to share in an aggregated way. And one of the unfortunate features of our, uh, of our of public life currently is that the best data on public life and public needs is not in the Library of Congress. It's not in the British Library. It's not in our national library systems. It's, it's in Silicon Valley. And it's monopolized by, uh, um, oligopolized by a small number of firms um, who have access to the data and don't. So improving um, our improving public life, I think um, expanding the range of ways in which we can express ourselves is gonna require opening up in very deep ways uh, access to the data uh, sharing, providing access to civil society groups who want to play, um, access that isn't currently easy to, to pull off. Now, I mentioned earlier that I'm starting my um, fellowship here, and so I have mostly questions about whether the human rights frame could work for um, imagining what to do, uh, how to produce uh, the information environment we might want. Do we have a human right? Do we have a right to high quality information? I think for the moment, it's simply an assertion to say yes. Um, but I, the more I've been playing with the idea of human, of um, quality information as a human right, the more I find that this is also an assumption that's fairly fundamental to multiple domains of theory building. In deliberative democracy theory, an area in which I work, um, the assumption that a citizen has access to high quality information uh, is largely unquestioned because all of the models assume that a voter on election day will go to the polls with some diverse access uh, to conservative newspapers, liberal newspapers, and will make good decisions along the way. Now, the theories about how deliberative democracy should work are far from how they operationally do work, but rational choice theory, um, the theory about how theories about how good public policy making, the new institutionalism, there, there are numbers of numbers, there are multiple theories in social science now that rely on the basic assumption that we as individuals have a right to our claim on high quality information about public policy problems, about the quality of the environment, about the qualities of our schools. So I think answering yes, a human right, we do have a right to information quality, uh, is going to be meaningful for taking these theories that we have about how democracy should work, or about how the market should work, or about how um, we should govern ourselves, taking those theories and operationalizing them in an exercise of voting, an exercise of consumer choice, or an exercise of governance. I think um, misinformation has become the mechanism through which all of those things can break fairly quickly. It's the means through which multiple forms of racial and gender and religious discrimination is encouraged, extremism and violence is stimulated, condoned, or ignored. And that's, that's one of the values I share with what um, the community that you've all been bu building around the Carr Center. 
Now, several of us are um, embroiled in this conversation about how to move from the social science of misinformation to studying the, from studying the problem to building something that would help address it in a nuanced and subtle and global way in through a mechanism that might involve some of the actors, um, political actors such as Russia and China uh, on, on issues that, that, we sh that all countries, all member states say of the United Nations uh, would find some affinity with. The, one of the best models we have for how to coordinate science and put science uh, into the service of solving a public action problem, a collective action problem is the IPCC, right? The Intergovernmental Panel on uh, Climate Change. Now, there are certainly IPCC critics. It took 30 years, right, to build up the credibility that it has. Um, there's uh, no doubt an argument to say that the IPCC hasn't been as successful, um, that the Paris Accords are, are um, far from being implemented and there's too, still too much to do. But I do think that member states in the United Nations system are starting to make decisions about how to do something about misinformation. And they're not copying the, the laws and rules that, that we might want to see diffuse across the international system. So for example, when Germany or France produces a new law um, on misinformation, trying to help the firms um, make good decisions about managing content, other countries, Thailand, Malaysia, will, will copy the laws, but implement with a different enforcement mechanism, right? Or, or add on different exemptions. We don't have, I think, a shared sense of what's effective and what works. I believe we're past the point of industry self-regulation. So for me, um, industry self-regulation is a non-starter, but that also means that we can't solve this problem without collaborating, um, encouraging collaborations between the researchers, um, the technologists and, um, public policy makers. So the broad concept behind an international um, intergovernmental panel on the information environment would be to help advance the science, coordinate the science of um, information studies, to track the global trends, identify uh, the conflict zones where misinformation is making things worse, worse, the complex humanitarian disasters where misinformation has effectively caused, set up the preconditions for conflict. I think the broad aim would be to engage multiple stake, stakeholders. Most of the decisions about misinformation are made by firms now. They are operationalized by Facebook's engineers, Google's engineers. Their, uh, their decisions only in the abstract taken by government agencies. I think it'd be uh, very important to involve citizens, uh, allow people to communicate their sense of risk, to identify issue areas or events in which misinformation seems to be shaping public, dis public discourse. I think it will be valuable to identify the common approaches to information quality, to promoting a healthy information environment that might be transportable um, across legal regimes and even into the countries that um, we might say have the, um, the poorest of human rights records. I think None of this will be possible without building bridges between industry and lawmakers. And there are many different kinds of lawmakers who try to tag uh, information access or information quality with the human rights frame and offer the threat of antitrust action or serious fines. Um, I do think we need to have those fines, that antitrust conversation uh, at hand. Of all the regulators around the world, probably the European Commission is the one with teeth that might actually follow through with regulatory, um, with regulatory oversight. But maintaining dialogue at the moment, there, there isn't a global body that can help maintain the dialogue between industry and multilateral agencies in a significant, sustained way. So building consistent bridges between industry and lawmakers. And you know, I don't mind admitting that there's a selfish academic interest here. Um, probably many of us have seen the um, recent spats between academics who've been cut off by the research initiatives of Facebook, other social media firms, having a steady supply of data, trying to get that data in a nicely anonymized way into public service is, is one of the core concepts, one of the values I think um, that this intergovernmental panel on uh, the information environment could help, um, could help disseminate. 
So specific objectives could include coordinating the research, promoting information access, especially in countries where access to information is, is, um, is um, expensive or restricted, and then sharing best practices for um, industry and government development. For our own team, uh, I could say a little bit, just almost towards the, this, the conclusion, um, I could say a little bit about what we'd like to do for the next year. We're going to be continuing our misinfo research on COVID-19. Uh, we have particular projects on PRC, um, People's, um, People's Republic of China-backed uh, information operations. We just issued a report with UNICEF on the impact of misinformation on children. And I think this is one of the most significant things we know the least about. Um, almost all the research on misinformation, its impact on, uh, on us as voters, on us as citizens, it's all done on adults um, for a variety of uh, ethics, human subjects reasons. But it means we don't know so much about how this information environment is shaping uh, next year's voters, right? The 12 to 16 year olds who are on platforms we don't use, uh, who develop information habits we're barely aware of, um, getting a sense of how this is going to shape future citizens is, is, is going to be an important research project. And then with the U.S. Institutes of Peace, um, we have a project on complex humanitarian disasters and the role of misinformation and making them, making them worse, uh, and the role of information quality in trying to, uh, uh, trying to set standards and improve, improve public understanding of a crisis. We're also doing more and more on capacity transfer. So um, civil society groups tend to end up stuck um, when a, there's an information operation launched by governments pitting other governments against, uh, against each other. It's often civil society groups who get thrust into the role of fact checkers, which um, from, from my point of view is a name, right? Civil society groups should not be fact checking content, shouldn't have to be fact checking content on Facebook. But there must be, there must be things we can do to improve the ability of civil society civil society groups to do some of the basic data science it takes to identify a campaign, to flag it for Facebook engineers, for social media engineers, um, and to, um, to try to close it up before it does damage to a policy agenda. Um, if you go to our website, you'll find a couple of regular alert systems. If you'd like a briefing on COVID misinfo, or we have a monthly briefing on PRC-backed information operations, um, please sign up. I'm happy to tell you more in the Q&A if you like. At this point, we're all thinking, trying to think as a team constructively because um, we're working somewhat on, on fumes in terms of the advancing the research on misinformation. Um, there seems to be so much of it. We thought it would go away uh, or diminish a bit a year ago, but that has not happened. I'm sorry, Jeannie, your answer was correct, but um, Kevin shouted his incorrect answer over yours, so he gets the points. Um, we're, we're running on fumes, but we're still, we're cynical, but not fatalistic, right? This isn't the world that we have to live in. There must be things we can do to clean up the global information environment. And um, we're still got that, I guess we're still, we're still operating on faith. We're operating on fumes and faith, um, but eager to talk to, uh, to others and eager to I'm eager to know your questions. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to say hi to Shushma and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you all. Uh, thank you. That was fascinating, Phil. And uh, Matthias and I and our entire team here is so excited to be working with you this coming year and hopefully for many years to come to really tackle this pressing issue and also to think about it within the context of human rights. So I think you very clearly articulated why this is a human rights concern because of the impacts on everything from the right to vote to the right to health to impacts on communities such as women or uh, religious or racial minorities. Um, so it's very, very clear why we would see this as a problem within a human rights context. And I also appreciated your talking about the frame for or I think project, and maybe we do another session in a year or two to really unpack what we've uncovered. Um, but I'm wondering, as you think about your intergovernmental panel and technology policy and stakeholder process, whether it makes sense to think of constructing that as uh, within a human rights lens, with a human rights lens, for example, integrating um, 
you know, values of participation or inclusion, you know, the perspectives of affected communities. So I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how to bring both the expert voices to that conversation and deliberation, but also um, those who perhaps don't have the ability to often participate in those august conversations. Yes, I think you're, you're um, this is a fabulous question because it's, uh, in a sense, it speaks to the, the fault of the international, one of the core weaknesses of the international system as a whole, right? The, the UN generally does not encounter specific civic grievance, grievances. Um, there are um, human rights uh, rapporteurs, envoys, and special appoint, you know, special appointees who do some of that translational work um, helping surface surface issues that then eventually get to the UNHCR as a, an issue. And in a moment where there is um, a massive refugee crisis, there, there will be global attention focused on uh, focused on an issue. But um, for the moment, this, the system right now is that if somebody in a community is feeling aggrieved or is being targeted in some nasty way, their primary outlet is to flag content. Right, to go on social media, the onus is on them. They do the work of trying to flag for social media firms to get the social media, the engineers of social media firms to, to respond. And the, there's so much we could talk about as being problematic, right? The role of the firms as censors or evaluators of that content. Um, the fact that the, the work is has to be done on users, has to be put on users. I think um, figuring out how to integrate yeah, that that uh, groundswell activism into an uh, an IPIE is going to be fundamental to making it credible. Thank you, Phil, from from my end as well. Um, by the way, one one thing uh, you said in passing about me living in a city where facial recognition technology is used, that is one of um, you know, make a case here for the city of Somerville, uh, which is one city over from Cambridge where I live in Somerville alongside San Francisco, I'm proud to say, actually has passed some pretty serious restrictions on the use of facial recognition by its, uh, by its police. So, but just for the record, uh, what I meant to ask is actually something else. Uh, so, uh, you know, you and I started discussing this question of whether there's a human right to high quality information, as you just put it, or Maybe can, one can translate that as their human right to the truth, maybe in particular context, we started discussing that a while ago. And uh, and I've started uh, to think about it myself quite a bit. And I, I kind of getting, I'm getting pulled in two directions here. So on the one hand, I want to say for the maintenance of democracy, uh, a human right, a citizen right, whichever the framing would be to the truth, to high quality information clearly matters when we are thinking about blatant exercises of deception, misinformation, disinformation of the kind that Donald Trump has been spreading about the, the vote counting process and various uh, issues in that neighborhood. So, so I see the pull and I think one could muster arguments there. At the same time, what I worry about is once if we formulate this at a generic level, as you did here, human right to high quality information, if we kind of think this through for the for life for the domains of life, you know, and and what what then what I notice then is um, half at least half truth and also deceptions fal falsehoods play an enormous role in human life all over the place. You know, starting really with you know the way we see ourselves in the world, right? So we you know it has to be grounded somehow in factual content. We can't be completely deceived about ourselves, but you know psychological literature. Is abundant on that, that we are all telling ourselves stories about ourselves that are, you know, somewhat connected to reality, but they're not fully true. That's sort of half truth. And political affiliations are like that, right? So they, again, there's, uh, you, you can't be completely disconnected from reality and you can tell evolutionary stories about why you wouldn't be around anymore. Your sort of being wouldn't be around anymore if you just completely disconnected from reality. But we also, Half truths play a serious, an important role in getting in and in, in making sure that people get keep right, so that you feel a sense of hurt in a group. A group needs an identity. So we, we are basically we are we, are, we have traditionally surrounding ourselves by half truth and religions also. You know, like a lot of half truths and. 
So my worry is, Phil, is uh, so it's more a worry, the articulation of a worry than a question. Aren't we overshooting when we, if we actually were to articulate such a right at a generic level and wouldn't we at least have to have some serious domain restriction here? And well, I, and I think your instinct is, is absolutely right there. There would, to get started, we would certainly need domain restrictions. I think, um, Perhaps instead of uh, the question, do we have a right to the truth? Um, I mean, the, the nuanced extension is, would, do we have the r right to be able to find the truth, truth should we choose to seek it? So I, I totally buy the argument that, um, that history is problematic and the his, historiography right, is, is uh, the discipline of figuring out how to tell which parts of which truths and which, which truths are in manuscripts. I'm sort of pragmatic on this in the sense that, in the sense that I do believe there are a set of issues, um, maybe a big set of half truths that we wouldn't spend time working with technology and government on, but that there are also a, perhaps a small set of um, existential risk areas, um, such as climate change, um, in which um, promoting high quality information is uh, a plausible route to unblocking, right? The, the, the blockage, the policy blockage and multi multiple levels there. So if there's an area of um, consensus, um, smoking causes cancer, right? There's the medical consensus that smoking causes cancer for 70 years and it's not, uh, it, there is no controversy. It's not some cancers or some genders, uh, uh, but, but a misinformation operation that um, goes to work promoting a particular article, or maybe it is your gender, and um, you know maybe it depends on the brand. That kind of thing is an example of um, a campaign that would denigrate something in which we we are can be quite confident is close to an important truth. I would say um, truths around genocides would be valuable to promote. And disseminate and to ask the technology firms to um, track truths around climate change it might be another issue area in which we should start. So I'm a pragmatist. Uh, we shouldn't start with the half truths. Let's start with a small set of public health, genocide, climate change issues that, that are significant problems to us. That's, that's terrific, Phil, as a way to really think about how do you actualize something like this. And I, I do think in, in many contexts, particularly when we think of economic, social, cultural rights, it, it isn't always like this clear cut sort of set of things that we have. And, and so it is upon societies and courts and institutions to, uh, to take on this heavy lifting to think about how do you make these rights a reality. Um, I'm wondering if you could give a brief definitional clarification for our audience about misinformation versus disinformation. I think that might be helpful uh, if you do differentiate that. Um, and I'll also draw on a question from one of our audience members where, um, let's see here. Um, gosh, okay, so are public service and in refuting misinformation and um, if you have mandatory uh, PSAs to, to address misinformation in social media, would those be effective? Wonderful. So I'm, um, I'm gonna use a little bit of you, the, answering your question to help me um, also tackle what Matthias has coming. Mean, for the most part, the um, disinformation is, uh, most of us define disinformation as um, a campaign organized purposely to mislead, full of falsehoods in a, in a comprehensive way, uh, in, in a systematic way, um, with uh, often multiple kinds of prompts appearing over several different social media platforms. Misinformation uh, refers to the content that is extremely subtle or is half truths with such a bent that um, effectively the user doesn't know that they're sharing things that are falsehoods. Sometimes this is um, photos taken out of context, um, fake news sites using the BBC colors or the, the New York Times font. That's often very subtle and shared without, often users don't 
don't know they're sharing that stuff. Much more recently, we've started to speak of malinformation. So if I can give a, throw out a third term, malinformation is what is produced when, um, again, so an organization purposefully emphasizes the negative, the, the critical. So if there's, if there's scientific consensus about climate change, 99% of the climate scientists said is, say it's human induced, 1% say it's not. Malinformation is a significant campaign all about the, the it's not part of it, right? Um, Overemphasizing the negative. So there's actually now multiple very nuanced flavors of misinformation and disinformation and malinformation. And public service ads, that's a fabulous question. Public service ads, I think um, there's multiple media studies now over many countries that show how civic education, public service ads, um, consistent programming do work, um, especially when targeted at children. There are several countries, um, Canada, Australia, the Dutch are particularly good at um, constructive, media um, media savvy uh, ads, how to be a critical media consumer. These are, um, yeah, we know what these programs look like. And I guess I want to thank the person who asked, who asked the question, because that could totally be in my list of specific objectives for what an IPIE would do, right? Encouraging countries around the world to invest a little more in civic, civic education and um, you know, tips on how to be a modern information consumer. Uh, thank you, Phil. Um, one quick note to the audience. You will have noticed that we have these occasional delays uh, as we speak. Unfortunately, the uh, university has had some difficulties of the sort of the last uh, 10 days or so, which is uh, somewhat ironic because we did so well with the technology throughout this whole time when we were on Zoom only. And after we came back to campus, somehow there's some issues that haven't been fully resolved. So my apologies for that. Um, Phil, I'm going to uh, pass on two questions from the audience uh, to you now. Uh, one of them, so Wendy Johnson in the audience would like to would uh, would like to would like you to elaborate a little bit about what this all entails for Facebook. You know? So, what are the concrete asks of uh, Facebook? Uh, and then there's another question by uh, Bob Wyman that I'm just going to read to you. Um, the question is: Our vocabulary for online responses is impoverished. We may like a post, but cannot dislike, agree, or disagree. Would tools more usefully detect controversial posts if we enriched our vocabulary? Wonderful. So what does it mean for Facebook and how can we enrich our vocabulary? So um, I think what this would mean for Facebook is that, um, and then the other social media firms is that they would need to share. Um, I think if 10% um, of the data, and I pick that number, that's just out of the air. If a significant representative sample of data were to be shared with the national research institutes um, for social scientists, investigative journalists to play with, um, that creates a public asset that can be put worked over for public problems. Um, at the moment, very little of it is, is shared, right? And there's um, uh, just over the last weekend, a scandal um, in which the one social science, one program that Facebook attempted to set up to distribute data to academics turns out to have not been sending the sample that um, they thought they had sent. And um, a year's worth of scholarly teamwork uh, for a number of international teams is uh, out the window or on hold while we all figure out what it is Facebook actually provided. If um, uh, you know, those of us who are academics often have to go through peer review, grant reviews. If we get our funding from the National Science Foundation or the ERC, we've had more human subjects oversight from ethics, peer ethics communities than any Facebook data scientist has ever had. So um, I, I, there are certainly mistakes that academics have made with sharing um, unanonymized data, but as a whole, we actually do have the infrastructure for sharing data from data from Facebook. Um, they just have chosen to try and build their own infrastructure. Now, the tools for enriching, I think um, I have some ideas. It's a fabulous question because we do have some of those keywords that we use um, in the study of um, what some people call deliberative polling 
or um, small group jury system deliberations. Um, one of the most famous examples of these uh, has been built by a Stanford team of political scientists and comm researchers who will take a representative sample of 150, 200 US citizens, lock them in a hotel in Houston over the weekend and present one of the most controversial abortion, gun control, the most controversial issues, um, the policy issues, introducing some experts and the people who participate have to go for lunch and spend time together. And they find over time that the extremes might come in a little bit, consensus can build with that kind of social contact and social contact. And so these small experiments for deliberation that involve face-to-face -face contact, they probably could happen over social media in constructive and interesting ways. We don't play right now with social media. And I guess I, I sort of realize I'm saying more social media might, might be effective, not less. I, I can't advocate, we're not gonna give up Twitter or take away Facebook, but there must be some playful ways to develop this language, to create deliberative instruments that would help um, you know, make technology for consensus building. And technology, uh, you know, the social media platforms right now, they're not built for consensus building. Thank you. That's a really, really important point to really think about the role of social media and consensus building. Um, I'm wondering if you can uh, respond to the thought around accountability, because human rights is often around accountability. And I'm just looking at a couple of the audience questions, and I'm going to merge a couple of them. So if we think about cor uh, corporate accountability, do the ruggy principles, um, the kind of UN guiding principles on business and rights is relevant with something else? And government accountability, um, as we think of the role of, uh, you know, states in perpetuating disinformation. What are your thoughts on accountability? Wonderful. Well, um, riffing out loud with you, I would say we do not have a system of accountability for the social media firms at all. Um, there, in most countries around the world, social media firms do not have representatives. Or if they do, they're, they're the PR team. They might be policy a policy team. They're not engineers. The important engineering decisions are made in San Francisco, and the policy important policy conversations about whether to take down a, an ultra uh, uh, a Nazi political party website. Those kinds of decisions are made in San Francisco. The difference is up. They do not operate well outside of English. Uh, as a language. The teams um, that they build from election to election are responsive in different ways. And sometimes when the social media firms do come up with a good program, uh, a get out the vote program or a, um, a positive constructive PSA around something, they'll run it in Canada, but not Australia. Or, the, or they'll offer something, they'll offer some reasonable concessions to the Australian government, but not provide them to the Tunisians. So accountability has to involve um, comparing how the social media firms seem to respond. They respond to the commission, the European commission. They respond when a senior politician in the US context goes after them. But beyond that, there's very few, there's very few multilateral agencies that can hold them to account. Um, I think the, the ruggy principles, I, I, I wanna, I'm willing to take that on as homework. I could see that there'd be ways they would apply to social media firms, but um, you know, ant antitrust action is probably the means of accountability for, for social media firms at, at this point. Um, thank you so much, Phil. This has been fascinating. And I think the beginning of many conversations, hopefully on how to tackle this very complex issue. Um, I'd like to thank our audience for joining us. We have a series of events this fall, and I'd suggest that you can follow us on social media, um, on Twitter, on, you know, on Facebook, um, also on our website, can um, have people join us, uh, sign up for our newsletter, and all of our events for the fall, uh, both series on intersection of technology, ethics, and rights, um, is posted as well as the events um, in our other series, um, The Fierce Urgency of Now. So thank you, Phil. Thank you, Matthias. And thank